Parasite the Maxim is up there at the top of my list of favorite shows that I've never actually found time to properly talk about on this channel, outside of an offhand mention of it in my list of the best Madhouse OPs, that is. Looking back, I'm kind of surprised that I never found a reason to talk about it because the anime has some absolutely killer fights and a real banger of an OP. But those aren't the things that I most want to talk about when I think about Parasite. Rather, there's this one moment from the first episode that has stuck with me since the very first time I watched the show. A moment that is by no means as significant as some of the plot turns and reveals that come later on, but that is so smartly written and relatable that as soon as I saw it, I knew that I was going to love this show and its protagonist, Shinichi. But before I get to that, I want to take a step back and ask you a question. What would you do if, one day, out of the blue, you were suddenly able to stop a speeding car with your bare hand? What would you do if you came home and found that hand possessed by an alien intelligence with inhuman strength, capable of shattering steel with a single flick? What would you do if that intelligence knew your name? I'm not talking long term here. Yeah, you might eventually become a superhero or get the arm amputated or, I don't know, try using the disembodied alien hand to jerk off just to see what it would feel like. N no, that's, that's just me? Okay. But again, we're not talking about measured, planned, long-term responses here. We're talking about raw, immediate reactions. So, if this happened to you, what would your first instinct be? If you're a filthy millennial like myself, your answer is probably the same as mine. You'd Google it. And when Shinichi discovers the parasitic monster Migi living in his right hand, that's exactly what he does as well. As soon as Migi passes out and he assures his mom that he's not whacking off, Shinichi hops to his computer and starts Googling every conceivable term that could describe what's happening to him. And he doesn't stop at just one or two search queries. He keeps Googling from the time he gets home right after school until dusk, which, considering that this is taking place in early fall in Tokyo, means that he spent at least two hours poking around for answers before giving up. On the face of it, this seems kind of ridiculous to us as an audience. We know that this is just starting, so of course there aren't going to be any search results for the parasites. But we millennial types are conditioned to believe that Google, or bingo in Parasite's case, has all the answers to, well, literally any question that we could think to ask. So of course a teenager in 2014 is going to turn there when they discover something strange and unexpected about their body. And the existential terror of finding a fucking alien inside your fucking hand will only be compounded by the confirmation through hours of research that you are well and truly alone in that experience. And what's really remarkable about this whole scene and the psychology behind it is that Parasite is based on a manga from 1988, a time when the internet was just a twinkle in Al Gore's eye. These elements weren't present in the original text at all, but in updating the story for a modern audience, writer Shoji Yonemura, a veteran of Death Note, Monster Rancher, Hunter x Hunter, and a ton of Kamen Rider series, created a scene that perfectly captures the mindset of modern youth, instantly making Shinichi a a thousand times more relatable than his manga counterpart. But moreover, it creates a strong, distinctly modern context for just how fucked Shinichi and the rest of the world really are. This episode starts with a man splitting his face open into a horrifying monster mouth and eating his wife's goddamn head. The next time we see that guy, he's practicing impersonating other people on television, and holy hell is the image of him morphing his face into a completely different skin tone and hairstyle ever creepy before going off to eat his kids as well. We see how that came to be in the scene where Shinichi is infected with a parasite himself, which is further expanded on at the end of the episode. And the OP tells us that there are a lot more of those things out there. And right after the Google scene, we see a human skin hanging up on a laundry pole. Yet, there's nothing about any of this in the papers. Right after Shinichi again stops a car with his bare hands, we see that the biggest story in the paper his mom is reading is about an athlete screwing around with 12 girls. Something that the show subtly connects to what's happening to Shinichi by showing a picture of the athlete covering his face with his hand, mirroring the last shot of the OP. It's not until breakfast the next day 
day that these murders start making the news, and still, nobody even thinks to make a connection between all of them. For Shinichi's family, this spate of homicides is immediately overshadowed by the fact that he touched a spider, which, as heroic feats go, is about ten times more badass than Mustang killing Lust, but still, priorities, people. All of this tells us that humanity is woefully underprepared for the attack that is already fully underway. We are seeing the start of what could easily be the human race's extinction going off of the thing rules, yet petty celebrity gossip apparently takes precedent over that. This scene is pulling triple duty, commenting on our present society, humanizing Shinichi in a way that modern teenagers can relate to, and raising the stakes of what's going on all at once. It's some of the tightest, smartest writing I've seen in a long time, and it's made all the more impressive by the fact that it's being integrated seamlessly into a story that was written more than a decade before anything that it's talking about even existed. It makes me wish that the whole series could have been updated the same way. As the anime goes on, it tends to stick closer to the events of the manga instead of changing things up to be more like this. And there's value in that approach as well, since this is the first time that Parasite has become a proper anime, and it just makes sense to try to please the people who've read the manga and have been waiting decades for that kind of adaptation. But whenever Studio Madhouse is able to put its own stamp on the series, it really sings, and it would be amazing if the whole show could be like that. When I look at this scene, I see Parasite coming this close to being a perfect modern reimagining of an older story, instead of just a really, really good anime adaptation. Fortunately, Parasite isn't the only manga about a lone young man fending off an invasion of transforming monsters masquerading as humans, using powers that he borrowed from those monsters, and Masaki Yuasa was allowed to fully update Devilman for his 2018 adaptation, Crybaby. If Parasite the Maxim adds layers of modernity on top of its original source material, then Devilman Crybaby mixes them into its very foundations. Its principal characters are all modern-day teenagers with varying degrees of social media presence, and it often uses internet broadcasts where the original would have used TV or newspapers instead. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Social media isn't just an element of Crybaby's story, it's the catalyst for it. It acts as an accelerant poured on the embers of human paranoia and violence to turn them into a raging wildfire that consumes, well, everything. A single bit of concerning misinformation that's never properly fact-checked by anyone spreads like a virus and kickstarts the end of the goddamn world. And the semi-anonymous nature of open online forums just ends up multiplying people's mistrust of one another while removing all empathy from the equation. Despite looking like a monster, Akira is able to really connect with a group of humans and stop them from hurting each other, but only when he talks to them face to face. Meanwhile, Miki's heartfelt pleas to the internet are met with rage, further distrust, and ultimately, uh, she gets turned into a lollipop. Devilman Crybaby uses the themes and ideas at the core of the original work, of how violence is part of human nature and we have to fight our own worst instincts to avoid destroying ourselves, and finds a modern context in which that message is arguably more relevant than it's ever been. It says something about a kind of society that Go Nagai could have never even imagined when he wrote Devilman, yet it does so in a way that's perfectly in keeping with everything Devilman is about. And that is what I want to see from, well, pretty much any adaptation. Because all art is a product of its time and place, and any updates to or translations of that art need to be made in consideration of the new time and place that it's being made for, in addition to whatever new medium the work is being rendered in. But it's especially important when you're dealing with older properties. That doesn't mean you always have to change everything about a story, though. I mean, to go back to the subject of my last video, the JoJo anime works so well in part because it embraces the anachronisms of JoJo as a period piece, rejecting almost any kind of modernization. And there is definitely a place for real throwbacks like Ushio and Tora and, more recently, Megalobox, which feel like the kind of old-school anime that they just don't make anymore. And some 
Sometimes needless modernization can even create continuity problems for a series. Like how it's kinda weird that when Cardcaptor Sakura's in elementary school, it's a really, really big deal that Madison can afford a big, ugly brick cell phone, and then two years later, in Clear Card, everyone has a smartphone. Same goes for the new series of Lupin, though I think it works a bit better there. Regardless, it's still something that you have to really think about with any adaptation, or even a localization project. Because if you don't, you can end up spending hundreds of millions of dollars to say absolutely nothing of value about anything. And at worst, even end up subtracting meaning from the original text. Even if you end up going with a totally faithful adaptation of an older story, it still pays to consider ways that it could be updated. Because that can help you determine whether the original work has a message and themes that are still timeless and resonant now, and how to best draw those themes out without fundamentally changing the setting or story. If you're working with this kind of adaptation, you need to always be thinking, how can I make this relevant to people today? Or by the same token, what is at the core of the foreign themes of this piece that I can make resonate in my country? Neither is an easy question to answer, but if you can answer them, you'll be a long way toward making something that's actually worth people's time. This way of thinking is especially important when it comes to adapting sci-fi works like Parasite. And on that note, Bookwalker has a Kodansha comic sci-fi sale going on right now. Boom! You just got surprise advertised. From the time this video goes live until May 8th, or maybe 7th, depending on where you live, you can get discounts on a ton of great sci-fi manga, including Ghost in the Shell, Apple Seeds, Space Brothers, Kokoku, Inuyashiki, Battle Angel Alita, Ico Incarnation, and, of course, Parasite. Volume 1 for all of those series is just a dollar, with subsequent volumes as cheap as 620 yen. And I've got some promo codes that you guys can use to get even deeper discounts than that. New Bookwalker customers can use the promo code BASEMENT at checkout to get 600 yen off any single ebook, meaning that you can pick up the second volume of anything that's on sale for less than 20 cents. And if you've already used that code, or you've had a Bookwalker account for more than a few months, you can use Use the promo code BASEMENT2, all one word, to get 30% off any purchase up to 1500 yen, which means that you can buy half of the first volumes on sale for just 10 bucks. Bookwalker is my favorite way to keep up with manga and light novels on the go. With it, I can keep a whole library of great stories in my pocket, ready to read whenever I'm on a flight to a convention or just stuck on a long bus ride. All of their manga is scanned in super high quality, so you don't have to miss out on any of the fine details as a trade for that convenience. If you're looking for a particular reading recommendation, other than Parasite, Ghost in the Shell, and Space Brothers, that is, I suggest checking out Real Account, a neato death game manga where players die if they lose all of their Instagram followers, and if they die in the game, all of their remaining followers die with them. It's a fun read. Go to global.bookwalker.jp or click the link in the doobly-doo to get any of those manga or any of the other hundreds of manga and light novels available on the store right now. And don't forget to use the promo codes BASEMENT and BASEMENT2 at checkout to get them at a real discount. Let me know in the comments below what other seemingly small scenes from anime have stuck with you over the years, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button while you're down there to catch more Mother's Basement content every week. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.